In the days of Danish supremacy over England, King Canute divided his kingdom into four parts. Each of these divisions was headed by an earl, who governed the people directly in his geographical domain. These earls ruled as completely as any despot, the king himself reserving one of the four governments as his own personal kingdom. The towns selected for the sites of governmental headquarters were inevitably the first to feel the yoke of complete oppression. The farther away from such a town a person lived in those days, the freer he was from governmental regulation, control, and taxation. Of course, this was before modern means of communication and transportation. Today, government control can be imposed over a large territory very rapidly indeed. A quarter of a century before the arrival of William the Conqueror in England, the ruler of one of these governments in England was Leofric, Earl of Mercia, and his government was centered in the well-known town of Coventry. The records indicate that Leofric was much older than his wife, but they made a handsome couple and were generally admired. Even back in those early years in England, taxes were the ever-present problem of existence and Earl Leofric was responsible to no one, having neither king nor parliament to tell him nay. Leofric instituted a system of taxation, rule, and regulation, which limited the production of the merchants and manufacturers of Coventry. We, in this modern age, have little realization of the amount of manufacturing that went on as far back as a thousand years ago. We live in a machine age, and we see everything manufactured by machines. But back in those olden days, manufacturing occurred too, although the process was more tedious and inefficient, and prices were universally higher. Everything, even then, bore a tax. All goods were taxed. All incomes were taxed. The roads were divided into sections, with toll gates marking arbitrary divisions. A traveler frequently had to stop and pay toll not once but many times, even during a short journey. And then even his horse was taxed. High taxes and widespread poverty go hand in hand, and the people of Coventry were suffering privation. Gradually, a resistance movement developed which opposed the high tide of tribute they were forced to pay to their ministering lord. Now, Leofric was not an evil man. But like so many who have held governmental posts, and perhaps still do, he concluded that his welfare and the welfare of his office were of more importance than the condition of the people he taxed. And having in his power the exclusive use of force, he proceeded to grind the citizens into still greater poverty, believing that the public good and the good of the public official are identical. So he legally stripped his subjects while lining his own pockets and all with a kindly smile on his face. Leofric's wife was a very beautiful, kindly, and generous woman named Lady Godiva. And when, through her maids and ladies-in-waiting, she learned of the condition of the taxpayers of Coventry, she was heartsick and indignant and took the complaints before her husband. The year is 1042 and Leofric, Earl of Mercia, is seated at the head of a table groaning under the weight of tempting viands. Lady Godiva is seated opposite her lord, and they are alone at their meal. Alone? Well, hardly lonely, for in those days in England, when earldom sat to feast, the room was crowded. Five or six huge band dogs padded about the great flagstone court. Half a dozen servants stood alertly to gratify the slightest wish, even to anticipation. A dozen men-at-arms stood at the various doors and windows or lounged about immediately beyond the range of vision of the earl. The meal is finally ended, and as Leofric leans back in his gilded chair and raises the final goblet to his lips, his lady speaks, timorously but sincerely. Across a half of venison and a demolished goose, she tells the story of oppression that, unbeknownst to him, has come into her husband's realm. My lord, the town people dine on bread and water, while we have only the best to please our fancy. I am ashamed to go out among the people. They are in rags, 
whilst I am clad in costly raiment. And the children, O Leofric, it makes my heart ache to hear their piteous wails, to see their sad and hungry eyes following me wherever I go. Her eyes flash as she relates instance after instance of poverty and oppression. Her long golden hair is caught up in coils, framing a face beautiful in its earnestness. Her aura of sincerity finally penetrates the wall of indifference surrounding Leofric. Begrudgingly, for, after all, what can a woman know of worldly things? Leofric listens to his wife's story. As she feels his attention, she becomes more confident. He is not the villain, she explains, but he has a lack of understanding of the problems of those from whom he collects taxes. Taxation itself is the evil, and there are many taxes which are inequitable, unfair, exorbitant. Look, she cries in the climax of her appeal, if it would do any good, I would take my jewels and pawn them, leaving my arms and throat bare of any adornment, so that the money raised thereby could be returned to those poor unfortunates who own thee, Lord, and who have been taxed beyond all bounds. Leofric is grudgingly impressed. He had not known of his wife's hitherto unrevealed gift of oratory, her interest in politics, or her knowledge of taxation. They came as a complete surprise. With a half-smile of admiration, and half-teasingly, Leofric nods in some portion of agreement. Milady, thou hast a silver tongue, and thou hast argued thy case fairly and wisely, yet with temperance and judgment. But thinkest thou that these problems can be solved so readily? Men must be taxed, else they grow unruly. Tribute is always paid, for how else will the people in the distant realms who never see their earl, know that they are ruled and have respect for law and order. No, my love, tribute and taxation are good. But perhaps I have been more careless about taxes in certain specific instances than is my want. But surely thou knowest this comfort we enjoy comes from this same tax money. Wouldst thou go without this meal? Thou sayest thou wouldst put aside thy jewels, but... Come now, that is no sacrifice for thee. Thou carest little for jewels. Wouldst thou have us live in a common hovel? Wouldst put aside thy fine clothes? Ha <laughs> Thy eloquence is fine. But it should be matched by noble deeds. Words alone prove nothing. Leofric pushes back his chair and stands. The men-at-arms snap to attention. He is about to stride from the room in complete dismissal of his wife's tender plea, but suddenly he pauses and turns back to face her. Madam, if thou art sincere, and if thou dost really have the welfare of my subjects in thy heart, prove it thus. Mount thy horse naked, and pass through the market of the village from one end to the other. Do this, and upon thy return I will repeal the onerous and unpleasant laws thou namest, and grant thine every wish in alleviating the excessive burdens borne by my people. It was said partially in jest, for the modesty and decorum of English ladies were a byword. And as Leofric strides from the court where he had lately dined, little did he know that his last instructions to his wife are the most famous of his entire life, and will cause him to live in history and to be remembered for generations yet to come. We may actually hear little of Leofric in modern times, but all the world remembers the beautiful Lady Godiva who took her husband at his word. The following day, mounted on a milk-white steed, and, history tells us, clad only in her golden tresses, she rode the length and breadth of Market Street without a stitch on. And Leofric, humbled and ashamed, kept his word to the letter. Taxes were repealed, and immediately good fortune descended on Coventry. A lowering of the tax burden inevitably provides incentives and a spurt in business activity, Good times usually follow. Lady Godiva's public protest of high taxation through nudity is not necessarily recommended today, except as a last resort. As taxes go up, we may find that we will all be taxed to the raw anyway, and in that case a parade of both men and women stripped to the buff may become inevitable. Perhaps it would be more decorous to have such a parade with the participants clad in barrels to emphasize the point. Whether we come to such a pass or not, there are two things to keep in mind 
if one truly desires to limit the government's tax forays against the public. Governments will always seek to increase taxes whenever we ask government to perform any more services or to provide any more goods. Every new plea for government help of any kind will be followed inevitably by a new round of taxation. Additionally, governments always expand in the face of any threat, real or fancied, leveled against government. Recent overt actions sired by left-of-center enthusiasts have had a single result, the enlargement of government enforcement agencies to deal with the problem. Perhaps this is what the radical elements wanted, a rapidly enlarging government. If this was their purpose, then the riots, the violent demonstrations, the bank burnings, and so on, which have darkened American skies, were admirably designed to bring about the results sought. However, if these same persons harbored the illusion that by shaking fists they would get the government to shrink, they were woefully misinformed. All governments will tend to enlarge as each new dependent is added, and all governments will also enlarge in the face of threats, whether the threat is made internally or externally. Now, if we are sincerely anxious to see the size of government reduced, then it follows that we must begin the process of refusing to call to the government for assistance under any and all conditions. The antidote to government power and prestige is the emergence of private character, the appearance of the individual who can and will manage his own affairs in such a way that he pays his own bills and, in doing so, threatens no one. In short, a mature civilization does not require government. Self-control is the perfect substitute for government control. The mature civilization is one composed of mature persons who solve their own problems without recourse to threats or to social dependency.